Um, so welcome to the Ka'au discussion on Hua Ka'i. And I'd like to introduce, of course, and we all know Hokulani Holt. Thank you, Hokulani, for um, being our presenter. So is that my mark set ready? Go. I never know if you call or what. Okay. Yes. I'll send it to you. <laughs> okay. Gail, you can mute your mic, please. Thank you. I, just, I have to send. Um, one of my staff said that they never received the confirmation. Oh, they didn't. Okay. No. I'm going to forward. Can I forward it to yes, the link? Of course. Here? Please okay. do. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Just all good for everybody. Okay, aloha and uh, welcome, friendly faces. To, to our next portion of our discussion for ka the Ka'au framework. Um, okay. For those of you who have come more than once, uh, mahalo for doing that. We'll, some parts of it will be a little review for those who may not have been here through all of the, the um, presentations. So bear with us when we have to go over a little bit of re review so that everybody is in the same place. So, uh, Hawaii Popo Okeao is a system-wide initiative and is throughout all of the universities and colleges. Um, what you see here is, is part of the directive. Uh, it is a system-wide initiative to develop the University of Hawaii as a leader in indigenous education. So to develop policies and initiatives that support the groundwork needed to foster student success and leadership, as well as in our community. Uh, Native Hawaiian values are practiced at all levels of institutional decision-making. And I know here for our own campus, those uh, are included in our long range and strategic plans. There are three thematic goals with objectives listed for each goal. The three goals are leadership development, community engagement, and Hawaiian language and cultural parity. So if you go to the uh, www.hawaii.edu, um, and use one word, Hawaii Papo Okeao. They have their own um, web, web page that you can see all of the overview uh, and what is expected. It is part of our strategic directions and it is who we are and what we want to get better at. This is one of numerous sayings that have been left by our kupuna. These olelo no eel span the gamut of Hawaiian outlook, environmental knowledge, family and personal behavior, and numerous other topics. As we begin to understand these olelo no eel, as well as mo'olelo and ka'au, we begin to understand how we can live well together, not only in our island home, but in the world also. Many things that worked well for our kupuna can still work well for us. And thus, this is one of my favorite olelo no eel, walehu lehu a mano mano ka Hawaii. Great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiian people. And because uh, the Hawaiian people, we have lived on these islands for hundreds of years those things that have been learned through that life here can still be brought to bear um, in how we live today. So as a really quick overview, the Ka'au framework is made up of four parts, hua, ha'alele, hua ka'i, and ho'i. 
Today, we will have a brief overview of each of them, but I would like you, but today we will also look at more closely Huaka'i, the journey, the experience. So as you look at, at the, the large topics on Hua, a catalyst to transform, the big why or the dream, what brought our students to college? Ka'alele, an embodiment of flight from the community, the preparation and separation, the commitment. We know that when we go into anything new and for our students, of course, into college, some things are left behind and some things we carry with us. And this is all part of the process. Also in there has the idea that even though some things are left behind, there are many things that we have to um, prepare with and prepare for in order to even step in the door at college. You know, among the things, how are you gonna get the money, uh, registration, seeing your academic counselor, all of these things that our students have to do in order to prepare themselves to come to college. And here we are at Huaka'i, or a series of life decisions, the journey, the experience itself. What do they need to leave behind? Who do they need to leave behind in order to move forward? Who will bring new life to them? Who will help them along this journey? And how will this education bring improvement to their lives. One of the Hawaii Papo Keau objectives reminds us that we are because of our parents and their parents and their parents' parents back to the beginning of time. This recognition that we are because of others is consistent in Hawaiian thinking. We did not get here because of us alone. We are here because of parents, grandparents, uncles, aunties, siblings, neighbors, coaches, teachers, and so many others. This olelo no eau is Navai hoi ke ole o ke akamai, he alanui imaa ika hele ia yo umau ma kua. Why shouldn't I know when it is a road often traveled by my parents? It was a reply given by Liho Liho, Kamehameha II, Kamehameha I's son, when someone praised him of his wisdom. He was quick to remind us all that it is not because of me, but because of those that have shared with me. So if we look at the Huaka'i, a series of life decisions the journey, the experience, perhaps these are some questions that might refer to the student. What do they need to leave behind? Who do they need to leave behind in order to move forward? Who will bring new life to them? Who will help them along this journey? How will this education bring improvement to their life? The Ka'a framework is originally focused towards student success. <clears throat> and as such, we need to think about the student experience. Today's conversation will be geared toward the third part of the framework of the Huaka'i. It is really a couple of parts, a series of life decisions, which will then lead the journey itself, where the knowledge and experience is gained. This perhaps is more than any other is the most difficult. It is the long haul. It is the slugging it out. It is where one must continue to look back at the hua that got you here in the first place. It is definitely where the times will get rough. It is definitely where additional assistance will be needed. It is where strengths 
and weaknesses are realized. And it is where perhaps unanticipated help will be needed. We all know this is where we all realize, whew, this was tough. I don't know how many of you have gone through this yourselves, but you know, when I was in college and what I see with our students, the last semester is the one that they struggle with the most because you can see the end. And to keep up getting there is the hard part as well. So because this is set in the Ka'au framework, the ka'al that we're going to look at and go back to, because this is the ka'al that many of us started when we thought about ka'al, is Maui Slows the Sun. It is one of Maui's most well-known ka'al and the story of how Maui does slow the sun. I would like you to get out a piece of paper, and if those of you who were with me last time, Get out a piece of paper, and as I tell the ka'au, think about the four parts of the ka'au framework and write down what parts of the ka'au fit into these four parts of the ka'au framework. What is the hua, the big why? What is the ha'alele, the separation and preparation? What is the hua ka'i, the journey? or the experience? And what is the ho'i, the give back or the contribution? I'm gonna read this out loud because it's how ka'au are best delivered. Yeah, it's best delivered to be heard. And you know, I know you can read, but I'm gonna read it out loud anyway. This is one of Maui's most well-known ka'au, the story of how he slowed the sun, how Maui slowed the sun. This ka'au starts on the east side of the island of Maui in the village of Hana. Maui's mother, Hina, asked him to please slow down the sun as it travels across the sky too quickly for her kapa to dry. Hina's couple was famous throughout the island for its beauty and was compared to the be beautiful white clouds that floated across the skies. In those days, the sun traveled so fast that no one could complete their daily task. The farmers and fishermen could not finish their work. Before they knew it, they had to return home with no fish or kalo because it got dark too quickly. Because of this, Hina advised Maui to seek out his grandmother and she would teach him how to slow down the sun. Maui was instructed by his grandmother to travel to Pailoko Waihe'e, which is on the opposite side and to create a rope from the new there. After traveling for several days, he arrived at Pailoko. He made himself kauda or rope out of the coconut husk as directed by his grandmother. From there, he was instructed to travel up Haleakala to Pu'uulaula and watch for the sun to rise. Oh, I hope I went through this correct. Okay. I did, okay. Okay, here we go. Get out your telephones. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Taking attention. Get out your telephone. Okay, my lights went on. I'm gonna off. I'm gonna swing around my high, my hand so my light will come on again. Okay, here we go. <laughs>
today, this is us. Okay, answer. Yay, okay, yes. Where does Maui live? He lives in Hana. Yeah, he lives in Hana with his mother, Hina. Once Maui was at Pu'u'ula'ula, Ula, he waited for the sun to reach over the horizon. When Kala began to rise, Maui ran across the crater floor until he reached Kaupo Gap. At the right moment, and as instructed, Maui threw his kaula up and lassoed the first of many rays of the sun. One by one, each ray came over the crater edge. Maui continued lassoing each leg until he captured all of the Lao's of the law's strongest rays and tied them to a bilibili tree. Kala tried to fight Maui off, but failed. The struggle continued on until eventually the two agreed that the sun would travel across the sky slowly during the summer months and, what, and rush quicker during the winter months. Maui then returned home to Hana and happily told his mother what Kala agreed to do. Hina could now finish drying her kappa as she desired, and farmers and fishermen could complete more of their kuleana during the longer days of summer. So if those of you might not know where this picture is, this picture is uh, facing um, the heo, uh, hale pi'ilani or pi'ilani hale heo, there in kind of the left middle of the picture. And that is the shoreline that reaches as you go more left, you would enter Hana Town. But that dark spot in the kind of left middle of the picture is Pi'ilani Hale Heo. And it is said to be one of the largest heo in all of Hawaii. In footprint, if not height, at its highest point. Okay. So this is the whole, um, I'm not going to read it again. This is the whole story. And I put it here just like I did last time so that when I share the slides, if you would like to have the entire story in one place, um, it'll be on this one slide by itself. Okay, so what one word will help remind you of this ka'au? Okay, mahalo everyone for sharing. And I think if ever, so I'm glad that the biggest word is sun. Yeah, I'm glad that the biggest word is sun and the next biggest word is journey because okay, we're on the right track gang. So sun and journey. So what this tells me is that maybe if you get up early in the morning sometime and you go out to watch the sunrise, 
maybe you will think of Maui and his journey each time you see that. Um, here we are during the winter and the agreement with the sun is that during the winter time, he can go more quickly across the sun. And so he's keeping his half of the promise. Okay, so this is, this is um, our uh, join in, make, make your uh, microphone unmute. So what were these parts of the ka'au? What, what do you think was the hua for this story? purpose why yeah so what was it for this story um, oh. to help his um family and community so they could fish and dry kappa and get some things done during okay. the day okay anything else what was the the, the, the hua or the seed or the reason or the big why for the story, in the story. His mama needed help making the kappa because the day wasn't long enough. Okay, all right. Anything else? Slow oh. down the sun. Say that again, I'm sorry. Slow down the sun. Okay, all right. So if the big why or the big, because these are still some of the, um, the things that we want to look at in the Ka'al framework is that seed, that hua, that, um, that inner reason for the story to happen. Yeah, and the, and the, for the story to happen, as we've discussed in some of our other um, stories, is often with the stories of Maui, his mother is an impetus for him to do what he needs to do. In this one, it also expands to not only that his mother asks him to go and, and find out what to do about the sun traveling so quickly, but also it impacted upon the farmer and the fishermen. So the community also uh, did not have the opportunity to finish what they needed to finish. So the hua was, was his mother who sends him on his journey, yeah? So ha'alele, who remembers what the ha'alele is? Yeah, what, what does uh, ha'alele is? remembers what Ha'alele is all about in the first place. So what was his Ha'alele in this, in this story? What does he leave behind? Yeah, what does he leave behind? What does he travel? How does he travel? Well, he leaves Hana and ends up in Piloko. Okay, he leaves his home. He leaves home. He leaves his home, yes. What else does he leave behind? He leaves his friends and family behind because he has to do this journey on his own. He leaves his friends and family behind because he has to do this by himself. Yep. Anything else? His home, his family, his mother. Yeah, okay. What about the huaka'i? What's the big journey, the big experience? What's the journey? First of all, he has to go from, from Hana to Waihe'e, so that's a big journey. Just going by car, we struggle half the time. What else? Making the rope and then the lasso struggle. Okay, all right, yes, great. Anything else? And now he has to go all the way up to Pu'ula'ula. Ula. Right, 
from Waihe'e, it has to go all the way up to the top of the mountain. Yeah, Pu'u'ula'ula Ula is the highest point on Haleakala. So, you know, it takes us an hour and a half to two hours by car. So it took a goodly amount of time. Plus, what do we know about once we get up there? When the when the sun is not up. It's cold. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it's hard to breathe with the elevation. Hard to breathe because of the elevation. Yeah. And he As he has to cross the whole thing to get to Kaupo Gap. And then he has to go across the, the bottom of the crater to get to Kaupo Gap. Because Kaupo Gap is the gap that faces Hawaii Island. Yeah, so then he has to go all the way across, you know, Okay, in my whole long life that I've lived on Maui, I have never walked the crater. I know people have, and I know people do it regularly. Some people do it annually. Something. Anybody in this group has walked the bottom of the crater? Silence, crickets, okay. So, so I maybe, <laughs> maybe we might, not we, uh, it, it's the royal we. Um, maybe folks might want to experience that, you know, sometime. I, I know, like I said, I know of people who do it every year uh, as kind of an anniversary thing that they do, and I know people do it more than more than once. But to travel all the way across, to go from um, one end and through. Kaupo Gap and down out into Kaupo where people wait for them with the car to drive them home as they're dying in the back. Um, uh, we know it is a hard journey. It is a hard journey that he did alone. Yeah, sometimes that's what happens. These hard journeys happen alone. And uh, what was the whole E? What was the give back? The the compromise with uh, the sun that he that the sun would move slowly during the summer, and during the winter it could go a little bit faster, and so that the community could get the things done that they needed to accomplish. So to give back to the community. So he fulfilled his hua, yeah. He fulfilled his hua and he returned to his community to continue to give back to his community. Yeah, he, he fulfilled his hua, he slowed down the sun, he helped his community, he helped his mother, and he returned home to be able to contribute that way as well. Maika'i, mahalo. So, what we are focusing on today is the huaka'i. And I'd like to pose these questions for us to think about. As an instructor or as someone who interacts with students, either in support services or in whatever that you do, do you ever think of these questions? Do you appreciate the struggles that students have? So then therefore, how will you assist these students with their journey? Can you direct your students to people or tools to assist in the journey? Do you know enough about this? If they are struggling some way, do you know enough about the resources and the tools that will help them. Do you have alternatives to your content delivery? I think uh, if you are an instructor, it's something you always think about. Well, back up. Good instructors, when I look at your folks' faces, is but good instructors, that's what they think about as well. If this is not helping, reaching, supporting a student, what else can I do? Yeah, what else can I do to help this happen? To help them be successful, to help them learn, yeah? So as we think about huaka'i, 
we also have to think about it from the view of the student. Yeah, understanding this story about Maui and what he had to do to, to struggle to get away, uh, to move from his home into this hardship and then back to his home. And we know the huaka'i is the hard part. Yeah, it's the part where the struggle really does occur. So as those of us who are interacting with with students, do we appreciate that? Do we appreciate that um, maybe this particular student, this girl doesn't come to class, and especially now during this COVID maybe, doesn't come to class because the children are at home and her mother has to go to work or her parents have to go to work. We're a little good that some of that is happening okay because we're on virtual classroom, but that doesn't make it any easier. Yeah, that doesn't make it any easier because some then still have to struggle with helping their siblings to go to their school that is on virtual as well. You know, I, I was, I'm still continuing to to teach hula, well, we're on vacation right now, but to teach hula, and I was teaching it virtually. And, you know, when they're stand like, like my, my children or my opio, when they're standing up and they're trying to hula and the dog is running in between their legs and, and the, um, the siblings are walking in the back, making faces at me that they cannot see, you know, <laughs> All of those things are, are happening and that are distractions for as much as they would love to stay in there a hundred percent. There are difficulties in this journey. And I'm sure now that we have gotten through these few months of being uh, virtual classrooms or some of you have hybrid classes, which I hear from Kaniel is worse, um, uh, that we have have tried to find alternatives so our students can still be successful. We have all done that in every classroom, in every support service. This olelo no eau a ohe hananui ke aluia. No task is too big when done together by all. And, you know, I truly believe that even though we have tried, we have had to be virtual and, and in our own office or home or corner of, of the dining room table or wherever we're trying to deliver, I, I believe and I hope that everyone knows that we're all in this boat together. Yeah, yeah we're all doing this for the benefit of our students. And as I, I look at these faces, I am almost certain that should you need to ask anyone that you see here for any kind of help, it will happen. Yeah, they will help. Okay, so let's try this. This is, you can write sentence if you want. You can write sentence if you want. It's a poll. Please share one way you assist students on their huaka'i. Maybe I should make music. Wait, maybe I should make music. I should have thought of that ahead of time. Because, you know, when I'm typing up this thing, I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to go right on by. So maybe I'll just do a little bit music.
hearts may command. We might lose everything we've got, but hopefully not the land. And our brothers and sisters sing along till everybody knew that song. to uh, read some of these. Uh, folks are, are um, sharing what they've been doing. Thank you so much for doing this. I, would, I had the benefit of being able to read everything because I wasn't typing. Um, and you folks are doing such wonderful ways, yes, to, to help them know that they are not alone, that they are understood, and as much as you can't let them slide on by, you are certainly here to help them move forward. Yeah. My Kai, thank you so much. So usually when we talk story a little bit in these uh, Ka'au framework things, uh, I'd like to, to I have a little bit of time for us to think about ourselves. Yeah, to have a little bit of time to think about how do you look at things for you. So let's just take a quick look at the Ka'au framework for, from our individual needs. Maybe some of these questions fit your situation, maybe it does not, but it might be something worth thinking about. So we talked about our hua, our dream, we know the overlook, we, over, we went and we looked at the commitment, the ha'alele, you know, we discussed that sometimes our hua changes. Yeah, what we started with earlier might change or we, we reach our hua, so we find another one in order to uh, move forward. I, I know maybe some of you have heard my my hua story, when the first time I went to school, I was in the College of uh, Travel Industry Management. Yeah, don't laugh, don't fall down laughing. I was in the College of Travel Industry Management. Not what I think I was good at. So I didn't do well <laughs> that first time around. I did much better my second time around. So as we look at the Ka'au framework, especially now as we look at the Huaka'i part, um, it can really help us to think about our own journey and the experiences we have had and are still having. Because when we can reflect on those, we can reflect on how we can better help our students in their success as well. You know, for some of us with a little bit more gray hair, it was a little longer ago that we were students. But I believe as I look at everybody, we're always lifelong learners. So there's, there's a lifelong student in each of us. Yeah, we're all lifelong learners. So your cow, your journey your experience. What did you need to leave behind to get here? Does anybody want to share um, uh, share this? 
when you first went to college, what did you need to leave behind in order to now get where you are? If we can remember way back then. Did any of us leave anybody behind? Any community behind when you had to go to college? I had to, this is Mark, hi. Hi. Hi, um, you know, I was thinking about this as, as you spoke. I'm living here for such a long time. I came here right out of college. And um, I'm from the East Coast. And I remember all through high school, just wanting to spread my wings. I was the youngest, but yet I wasn't bound to where I was. And as sad as my mother and family were that I was going to leave, I was never more excited. Um, and, I, and I had to leave them behind and didn't realize until after I left them behind that that was based on my thoughts and feelings and style and the way that I was an explorer. That was what was going to get me there. But during that process, I had to always remember that I had to go home and I had to remember home and I had to remember my roots that were home and associate with people that reminded me of home. So I had to leave it behind in order to grow, but also couldn't forget it and couldn't and, and, and had to always honor and respect it um, because it, it really is who I am today. And I wouldn't have been so lucky to be with this wonderful group of people if it wasn't because of who I was. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> yes, anyone else? What did you need to leave behind to get here? I'll share. Um, for me, I think the biggest thing that I needed to leave behind was my fear of failure. Uh, and that was, it was, uh, that was a big challenge to, to really let go of that because I had held on to it for a long time and to take that step and, um, and move forward um, with a sense of like, I can, I can do this. I can do this <laughs> because I, I was really scared. I mean, I almost didn't even go to college because I was so afraid of failing. So I can't believe Paul is afraid of anything. Ha! ha! <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> Anyone else would like to share? Well, then let's move on to the next thought. Who helped you? along this journey. Someone else want to share about who was there for you? Who helped you to get to where you are? Hi, I will share um, because I got a lot of help. I got a lot of help from outside agencies. Um, I went back to school when I was 30 and it was my therapist that encouraged me. And she wrote a letter to this um, kind of like a social service program that supports students financially. Um, and she just wrote this incredible letter and I received scholarships um, for the tuition and my tools. And also when I got into the school in my second year, I ran out of money and it was the financial aid um, director who found grants for me. So, you know, this helped me like even now, like, like I don't have that shame in asking for help anymore <laughs> because I think even about myself when someone comes to me, like I'm just waiting for someone to ask me for help, because I like to help. And you know what other people do? So my help came from outside my family and um, just from people I would have never expected. Um, yeah, so 
That's it. <laughs> mahalo, mahalo. Anyone else who helped you along this journey? Because remember, we're talking about the huaka'i, that that journey that got you here. Could it, um, whether it was school, whether it was to leave home, whether it was to to find finances, whether it was um, a place to live, who helped you in order for you to be able to be where you are today? I'll go ahead and share. Uh, sorry, Melissa. Um, I was empathizing though when you were talking about our students and what their challenges are at home. My daughter was crashing down my office door trying to get help on her science homework as you were saying that. Um, but you know, I, I think for me, one of the interesting things that I had to leave behind was my notion of what I was supposed to study at college as a, you know, a, a pragmatic major that would turn into some sort of practical employment and gravitating towards things that I was really interested in studying. And so I had some really great um, faculty mentors along the way that really just kind of asked me about what is it that I want to pursue or at least encourage my natural curiosity towards things that weren't so practical that uh, ended up for me being, I think the most enriching things in my life. Uh, but I don't think when I started that journey, that was my understanding or my mindset. So I really appreciate those moments along the way. And I can you know, think about those individuals in, in, in different stages and different steps for giving me the information that I needed at that time. Um, but I think for the thing that stands out in my mind is those were conversations that were in the middle of a semester in week six on a Tuesday. And so I, I always think in my mind that never underestimate the opportunity that we have as faculty to have those really important conversations with our students and what difference it might make in their lives and their trajectory on a Tuesday in week number six. Mahalo. Yeah, that, that's my, my choice for travel industry management. Yeah, where am I going to make money? Right. I was, a, I was a business management major when I started, which is a far cry from where I ended up. Melissa. Uh, oh, 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 go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say um, definitely some big um, support that I got along the way uh, came from a few really encouraging, uh, outstanding professors who saw something in me that, you know, and, and they were willing to kind of come alongside me and sort of, you know, cheer me on and, and, um, and encourage me along the way. And that, you know, gave me a sense, you know, to, to add fuel and to add a sense of hope and, uh, and, you know, I, I am, I am doing this and I'm, I'm actually doing it well. And, and I'm, you know, so I think some, some really awesome teachers, some great teachers that were really influential. Along with that, I remember thinking, because I was on the big island and I thought, well, you know, I need to find something that I can do there. And I'd been the librarian assistant out in Pohoa. And I wanted to move forward. And um, one professor looked at me and just said, so where are you going to graduate school? And I said, oh, I, I can't go to graduate school. I, I've got a farm. I've got, I, the, I, and I was, you know, closing those doors. And he looked at me and he said, I didn't ask you if you were going. I asked you, where are you going to grad school? And just the process of opening that door, which is what we as instructors try to do for our students all the time. He opened the door and it was like, yeah, I, I can do that. And it really did change a lot of directions. Um, Dan Brown, Gail knows Dan. Anyone else? Okay, and so our last question, how will this experience bring improvement to your life? And I uh, and we don't have to answer this one. What I put this forward was to particularly say 
that each experience can bring improvement to your life. Yeah, so, so if you look at how, how even the junk ones, even the junk experience, uh, experiences, if at that time it was a struggle, at that time it was uh, not the best experience in your life, even that can be, bring improvement to your life. And, and you know, sometimes with our, with our students or the students that we work with, when, when they, they don't seem to see that there is any light at the end of the tunnel, if we can help them understand that this struggle is still a good thing, you know, students are not going to believe you when you say, oh, this is really good, this is really good, you know, you're going to get through this and you're going to be so happy and you're going to feel so fulfilled and they're going, no, I just want to go home. <laughs> yeah, so um, if, if we can remember our own struggles, our own um, help mentors, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to share this, this one story because in essence, I didn't do anything. So uh, my, my, I, I've been a, a single parent for a really long time. And so my eldest daughter um, wanted to be a doctor from when she was a, a sophomore in high school. And I was a single parent. And so I'm going, holy kamoli, how is this going to happen? Well, fortunately for me, she was really smart. And, and so, you know, she, she did well in school. She, on her own, she she did the, the kinds of interviews, the kinds of, of seeking funding. Uh, we were really fortunate that she received the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship, which gave her four years of, of scholarship for her to get through school. All she had to do was spend the four years back in Hawaiian communities to help Hawaiian communities, which is what she wanted to do anyway. So that was a win-win. So, you know, sometimes um, our, our students, even if they have that drive, yeah, even if they have a drive, they still need help. Yeah, even if they know where they want to go, they've got the tools, they, they still need help. So what I'm saying this for is that even maybe the A student that turns every because that was Luukia turns everything in on time. She sits at the front of the room and all of that. They still have struggles mm -hmm. that, that we can help them with. Yeah, that we can help them with. Okay, mahalo for sharing. Anybody want to add anything before I move on? Okay, mahalo. Awi ke kailoa, one who swims the distant seas, one who travels afar. I chose this olelo no eel because as a seafaring people, we are well aware of going out beyond the safety of land. We know when we do this, we leave behind all that is stable and known. While we might be familiar with the seas that immediately surround us, there are still many things beyond our control. There are shifting winds, currents, and tides. The weather can change. There might be problems with the canoe, or waves may overwhelm us. But each of these experiences also build our internal database. The next time it happens, we can better navigate because now we know. This is us, and this is definitely our students. Awike Kailoa, one who swims the distant seas, one who travels afar, who is on their huaka'i.
I, I usually end with this because I want us to remember Hawaii is the foundation of our world because it is where we live. All that Hawaii is about should permeate our lives in and out of our college. We have chosen it to be our home. We should make it an important part of our lives. Mahalo. Mahalo. So does anyone have? Oh, yeah, thanks, Melissa. Now, now I can see the chat. See, I couldn't see the chat before because as you all know, when you're on this kind of stuff, you can't see the chat or, well, even if you did, I get too much distraction for me. So, so um, oh, yeah, encouraging. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, just like going out beyond the shore. Yeah, going out beyond the shore to be fearless and unafraid of change. Change is scary. Change is super scary. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions for me? I've, I've reached the end of the, the formal presentation, but does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to share? One of the things I was just wanting to share, and it's kind of been bubbling up for me for many semesters, but I think that the pandemic has really brought it to the forefront for me. It's just that sense of community that's involved at the university and the role that it can play in people's lives. And in some respect, just welcoming students into that realm and uh, understanding that it's a community and not just a means to an end to kind of move through and graduate, enter the workforce, but it's something that will always be an important part of your life. And I think at Maui College, you know, our students tend to kind of come onto campus, take their classes and return back to the world outside the campus. But I think the pandemic in some ways has created this virtual community that uh, I'd, I'd really like to see continue forward. Because I, I think it's really powerful for students to, because it's created a sense of normalcy in some regard in a very abnormal time. And so I, I think that's something we can really tried to drive forward as a campus. Mahalo, yes. You know, that's, I think that's one thing we've all learned. Although it being on Zoom a lot is very tiring, we have learned how to do a bunch of really cool things. Yeah, in these, in these last nine months or hmm. eight months that we've had to, to do this, we've learned, I have, and I'm, I'm looking at people who are life, lifelong learners. Um, we have learned some very cool stuff, yeah? So we can always share that as a part of the community that we have become, yeah? Anyone else? If not, thank you ever so much and thank you for your, your comments and um, in the chat box, Joyce. Um, Thank you everyone for being here. I wanted to remind everyone that the next Ka'au session is on January 20th, which is a Wednesday at three o'clock. Please join us then for the next um, Ka'au session. Take care, everybody. Mahalo, ahumiho, aloha. Mahalo. Happy holidays. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.